Welcome to this forum on democracy demands and end to police violence. My name is Tim Johnson. I'm a member of the African American Equality Commission of the Communist Party USA, and this forum is sponsored by the Commission. There's been a growing fight back in the streets of cities across the country against police violence. This is an issue that seems to be growing rather than abating. And recent studies from the police violence report have noted that the number of police shootings have actually increased from 2020 to 2021. In response to that level of violence, there's been a large number of organizing within communities across the country, specifically in African American and Latino communities, but in other communities also. They're all demanding an end to police violence and searching for various kinds of forms in which the community itself can take control of the police department, which is generally summarized as community control of police. We've invited a number of people from across the country who are actively involved in this movement to have a discussion on police violence, ways to end police violence, and how to implement community control of police programs. The first guest we'll have is Molly Nagan, who's an organizer for the Tamir Rice Campaign for Justice in Cleveland, Ohio. Secondly, Mike Madden, who's a member of the St. Paul Federation of Labor. Third, Samaria Rice, who's the CEO and founder of the Tamir Rice Foundation. Fourth, Sydney Loving, who's an organizer for the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression from Dallas, Texas. And finally, Frank Chapman from Chicago, who's the executive director of the National Alliance. Um, thank you so much for having us today. Um, Samir's campaign for justice is ongoing. Um, just to give a little bit of background, uh, Tamir Rice was murdered in 2014, which is over seven years ago, um, and he was only 12 years old. He's actually the youngest documented victim of police murder in the United States. I'm really honored today to be joined by his mother, Miss Rice, and I just want to give a little background. Um, so he was a standing alone um, and on a cold, you know, winter day in at a park that was pretty empty. And um, he had what turned out to be a toy gun. Um, it looked like, you know, a real one. And people uh, who walked by either, you know, knew it was fake, ignored it, or maybe felt like, oh, is there a problem here? One of them, called the police on him. And in the call, they said, it's probably fake and he's probably a kid. Um, but <laughs> that was never relayed to the police officers who responded to the call. And the police officers responded to the call as if, you know, we don't have an open carry state in the state of Ohio, which in fact we do even if Tamir was an adult with a gun, he was within his legal right to stand there with it. Um, but they responded, they rolled up and within a second opened the door and shot him dead. Um, this situation rocked our city and it rocked really on an international level. This was right at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. And so now Tamir Rice is an international name. So the story of seeking justice for Tamir is not just about that moment of, of, of crime, a of police crime, but it's also about the ways that the justice system is biased in favor of the police. And it's also about the ways that media and politicians and even people in the movement 
um, took advantage of, of, of this situation to make a name for themselves. Um, there's a combination of the fact that when they killed Samir, you know, they erased his voice. And just the other day, we had a protest at the very site where he was murdered because there was a dedication ceremony. We had national figures, Congress people, NBA uh, bosses, Cleveland Cavaliers bosses all coming together to dedicate a new gym at the very site where he was killed and they never once mentioned his name. So on the one hand, we have the erasure, but then on the other hand, we have this co-optation and this, this way of, you know, I'm on the good side and I'm gonna just, you know, talk as if, you know, you can trust me. We had a prosecutor who um, was kicked out of office because of his malfeasance and his lack of um, action on the case of Tamir Rice. And then the next prosecutor came in saying, yeah, what he did was wrong. You know, this was an incorrect, this was, this was all biased and then did nothing. And when we're pushing for the case to be reopened, won't even meet with us. When I work with Ms. Rice, uh, there's, there's this thing she said to me the other day. She said, I've never had so many people try to help me as try to take from me. So I just wanted to be present with the fact that we're dealing with death when we're talking about police murder and police violence. And I don't think that it's said enough just how serious, you know, I mean, people act like it's a trend sometimes. People act like you, like anybody can just, you know, <laughs> we want people to get involved, we do, but it's very humbling, this work. And we want people to come in a good way. So, um, at the site of his murder, um, we had a, a ceremony to honor his life this past year. It was a libation ceremony and it was really beautiful. We had a circle of people come together um, to say their prayer, to speak to him um, and, to, and to call for justice. Um, we try to make sure that the people are involved every step of the way. Uh, in this campaign. And that's really important to make sure that it's in the masses. Um, and I'm really grateful to be on this call because I know communists really are, are really like focused on how does this respond to the need of the community? We can't separate it from the community. And whether it's Sean King or, you know, uh, Justin Bibb or, or Michael O'Malley or or even Kristen Clark, you know, people kind of make a name for themselves off of this movement. And here we are with Samaria Rice, who can actually speak on behalf of her child. And she's so often left off and left out of the conversation. So we had the honor of working with the Communist Party uh, to push for justice for Tamir. We coordinated with DC communists as well as Cleveland. Um, we have rallies. Uh, we coordinated in coalition to bring down the political influence of the police in the city of Cleveland. Um, and we can go into some of that, but if you know what happened was that the Cleveland police eventually kind of backed off uh, because of because of our work. And you know, realize that the, the times have changed. You know, folks are looking out to see, you know, who who who's who's here for the police or who's here for the people. So one of our main wins, while we haven't gotten justice for Tamir yet, um, is that we, you know, changed the, the, the political power structure in the city of Cleveland. We got the first black woman ever elected to um, the Northern District US Attorney's Office. 
Um, you know, Justin Bibb is the mayor of Cleveland now, and he was the only candidate who, who supported issue 24, which is a ballot initiative Ms. Rice will talk about and, and pledge to not take any donations from the police union. And we passed this U24. So there is hope, there is some changes that are occurring. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking more about, you know, how we can all work together. Thanks, I went over, so I'll stop. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Molly, that was very good. Uh, next, we have Mike Madden, who's um, active in the St. Paul, Minnesota Federation of Labor. I very, very much appreciate the comments of Sister Nagin. Uh, just as a context to uh, what I'm going to say next is the Star Tribune has pointed out since the year 2000, there have been 215 deaths by police in Minnesota. So it'd be no surprise, um, in addition to the many high profile in your face murders of citizens of color that um, in Minnesota, uh, they've identified uh, since tw uh, 2000, um, that there has been 119 Caucasians die at the hands of the police and 96, which is a breakdown of Asian, uh, African-American um, and um, Hispanic. So uh, I am no particular expert here. I would just, I'm sharing with you um, the flavor of how we came to this place in the Minnesota trade union movement. So um, uh, several years ago, the FLCIO came to Minneapolis uh, with a racial and economic justice committee. Out of that, um, the Minnesota AFL-CIO called for the formation of a racial and economic justice committee. So this is our six vows to try to address um, that paid public servants believe they could kill, murder on live TV and suffer no consequences. So these are our six vows. These are our six vows in struggle. We vow to take a stance and admit that the heartbeat of racism is denial. We vow to practice self-awareness every day to recognize our own biases and shift our mindset uh, and those around us. We vow to listen to other races and educate ourselves about the history of racism and discrimination, what it looks like, what it sounds like, and what it feels like. We vow to confront racial, inequalities every day because we know to keep silent projects complacent behaviors. We vow that we will interrupt systemic racism by working at changes at all levels, all the time. Lastly, we vow that to stand together in solidarity and hold each other up to drive the changes we believe in. And then there's just several um, resolutions that I believe are guiding and inspiring um, our trade union movement as part of the Minnesota AFL-CIO Racial and Economic Justice Committee. Um, one of the whereas is that racism, white supremacy, and anti-Blackness were systematically embedded in American society from our nation's founding when slavery was the dominant base of the economy and despite historic heroic um, and historic progress to destroy its bases in law, continues to pervade our country's social and economic life, causing enormous harm and suffering to members of the black community and other peoples of color. Whereas racism is a tool to divide working people and weaken our political and economic power with an aim to impose austerity, destroy unions and topple democratic institutions and rights. Whereas President Trumpka on June 3rd, 2000, 20 spoke about the urgent need to dismantle oppression in our workplaces, our health systems, our housing system, our voting laws, our criminal justice system. Resolved that the Minnesota AFL-CIO work to educate union members about the way race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and other differences impact the lives of our members and would-be members and build 
common understandings of how racial bias and discrimination divide working people and undermine our collective power. Be it further resolved that the Minnesota AFL-CIO commit to dismantling systems of oppression, explicitly white supremacy and anti-Blackness and achieving intersectional race and economic justice in our organizations, our local unions, our workplaces and across our labor movement and building power among union members and communities to change the institutions and practices that prevent us from advancing a shared vision for a just anti-racist and democratic economy that works for all. Um, it further resolved that the Minnesota AFL-CIO will seek justice for George Floyd and all who have died from police brutality. And the Minnesota AFL-CIO stands in solidarity with all people who are subjected to discrimination, oppression, and indignity and inequality. Um, so in a nutshell, this committee, guided by the best practices from leading central labor bodies, manifesting best practices in principle and carrying through in the community. That's, that's something to achieve, obviously. We have a thoughtful, engaged, and well-balanced and dedicated trade union committee that is expanding and benefit from leadership from our diverse, diverse community. My personal observation is for Minnesota, we are working to trying to put our hands around. The next steps could be to agree upon and carry out breakthrough work, Minnesota version, along the lines that brother Frank Chapman and the incredible Chicago community finding their voice and exercising agency in police matters as it relates to who dies and who lives. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, next, we have Samaria Rice, who's, like I said, the CEO and founder of the Tamir Rice Foundation and is also of the mother, the mother of Tamir Rice. Yeah, so it's a few things that I would like to touch bases on. Um, Samaria Rice, the mother of Tamir, <clears throat> and the CEO and the founder of the Tamir Rice Foundation. <clears throat> and basically, uh, we, uh, I purchased a building in 2018 in the city of Cleveland, where we will offer after school uh, free programming in the inner city uh, for our Cleveland children. Um, programs like mentoring and tutoring, performing arts, expression arts, things that Tamir benefit from and his sisters and brothers. So that will be our way of giving back to the community as I um, came into this journey because of the loss of my son, um, I was able to be a part of um, conversations in um, regarding um, police reform and um, the changes that needs to be in this country, basically. Um, also, I was able to be a part of Citizens for Safer Cleveland, which is a group of families um, they got together and started going to the um, the CPC meetings in Cleveland. I was not aware of all of the corruption and conspiracy and cover up of murders that was going on in Cleveland um, until I went to a presentation um, that was uh, given by a person at the CPC. Um, and it gave us the hundred year of corruption and conspiracy and cover up of murders and things like that. But by that time, we were still engaged with trying to get issue 24 passed. And issue 24 is real police accountability, basically a civilian oversight, um, which Cleveland desperately needs, right? Uh, we have tried for the last hundred years to try to change things and things did not go through. So issue 24 was a really, really big win. It gave Cleveland hope. It gave me a little hope to see the change in the community and um, how we was able to get it um, implemented into the legislation and things like that and get, to, get it part of the charter. So um, it's a big win for Cleveland. Um, it's just about making sure that they follow the rules and the recommendations and making sure that we stay a part of those conversations and be at the table 
that also what helped us just really being engaged also with some community organizers as well, like Molly Nagin and a few other people that was able to help us um, get the ballot initiative passed. Um, you know, it's just unfortunately that the consent decree, which I'm just learning about it because of the death of my son, meaning that it been to Cleveland four times, meaning that the DOJ has been to Cleveland four times trying to clean it up and, you know, have to go in and basically babysit the Cleveland Police Department because of the cover up and the conspiracy and murders and stuff. And that's just one uh, like one uh, department, right? We have, uh, you know, we have so many police departments in the country, let, let alone in the state of Ohio, it's probably over 850 something police departments. Somebody tell me why do one state have so many police departments, number one. So, um, and I'm gonna wrap this up shortly, you know, like I said, I could touch bases on a whole bunch of stuff, but where I'm at in my life right now is, um, you know, a few a few things. I'm still um, trying to have a conversation with Christian Clark, which she's the DOJ, which at this point I'm asking her to give me details of why they cannot um, indict, indict Timothy Loman and Frank Granback for willful intent. The statute was 242. So she tells me that we need a better statue. Um, we need a better statue. We need a stronger statue. And my attorney is like, well, why can't you just challenge the statue? We have a, we have a letter from prestigious lawyers in the country, Brian Stevenson, also Angela Davis is on the letter as well, saying that you can charge him. So she is a coward at the end of the day. And I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I don't, I don't have time. My son is the youngest child in America that has been murdered. And you cannot tell me, you cannot tell me that those two officers should not be in jail. So now it's just like, I'm thinking of other ways and hopefully um, I can get me a Supreme Court lawyer to, 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 uh, to challenge this. And again, my attorney explained a few things to me talking about Christian Clark should have been the one to take this to the Supreme Court. At the end of the day, America is built off of genocide, blood, sweat, and tears on American citizens, starting with black and brown folks. At the end of the day, the white supremacy is real and we are very much aware of it. To me, I believe all of, it, all of this needs to be abolished to me, at the end of the day, I think it needs to be a people government. If, the, if, if Congress is not gonna help, if the Republican Party is not going to help, the Democratic Party is not going to help, who is going to make a law saying cease fire on black and brown folks, black and brown people? Who's going to make that law? It's simple as that. So at the end of the day, when it comes to white supremacy in this country, we know who we're dealing with. We know exactly what this is. We're not new to this. We are not... Um, we don't have the shades put over our eyes. It's certain leaders that God has called upon to lead us to victory and for us to wake up the masses and to continue to wake up the masses of the people the best that we can. Because it's a lot of them sleep and think that this is the way of life. This is not the way of life. When you have been traumatized in a horrific way, whether it has been in jail, um, been accused for something that you didn't do, that is traumatization. A, ch a mother burying her child, that is trauma traumatization. You know, by the hands of a person that was supposed to protect and serve, like somebody has to be responsible for this at the end of the day. And that's where I'm at. And like I said, I could touch bases on so many things. I have so much knowledge. I have so much experience. It's just what y'all want to talk about at the end of the day, because I'm to the point like who owns this country and why are we getting murdered in, in, in death and murder still over here in this country in the 21st century? What is going on in this country? So that's where I'm at. Thank y'all. If y'all have any questions, let me know. Okay. Thank you. And hopefully after the pan we go through the panels, there'll be some open discussion and maybe you can people can ask you some questions about 
some of the points you've raised. Um, the next speaker is Sydney Loving, who's uh, from Dallas and is an activist in the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Um, yes, my name's Sydney. I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm with the National Alliance. And um, first, thank you to all the panelists and your very powerful words. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about coalition building in the fight against police crimes. Um, and of course, the fight against police crimes is a very key piece of the fight for Black liberation overall. So what coalition building really comes down to is that there's so many different elements in a different area, in a given area. You really have to investigate and uh, find out what the demands are, what the issues are, what are, one of the panelists was speaking about the, you know, the needs of the people, right? What are, what are people dealing with and find out what areas the folks are organizing in. And that's where we find out where we can align with other elements and where we can find common ground. And it's not to agree on every single thing, but it's to unite in action to get something done. Because if you wait to build and work with only the elements that, you know, think the exact same as you, you're going to be very lonely. You know, what, what we're doing is ultimately a confrontation. We're, we're confronting a racist police state. We're confronting this, this racist system. And in a confrontation, you need people fighting by your side. You need allies. So, um, you know, within this, this movement, there's a lot of ideas, a lot of different ideologies, but we're not fighting a battle where the terrain is just ideas. Um, the terrain that we're fighting on is young brothers and sisters losing their lives over traffic tickets, um, over everyday interactions with police, having their rights stripped away, being targeted and harassed, and that there's no legal resource, legal recourse or accountability for the police departments that are carrying out this abuse on the daily. So that's the terrain that we're fighting on. And so the point is, we have to keep this in mind so that we, we can unite wherever we can unite with as many elements of the community as possible to struggle together, even if all of our ideas are not aligned, which they won't be. So the United Front, it's, it's just so powerful because it pulls together all of these different experiences that are pointing to the same system and saying that this is wrong. So let's get together and fight it. And within the alliance, why community control of the police is really our North Star is because what we're trying to do is change the relationship of power between the police and the people. Community control, fundamentally, it's a democratic demand because it's saying very boldly that the people should make the decisions around policing that's going on in our communities and have the power to hold police accountable for their crimes. And that's what we're doing. It's, it's a democratic demand that comes out of the struggle against police terror all over this country. And when we deal with the problem of police terror, we, we're dealing with something that's going to open up whole new opportunities and spaces for organizing within the Black liberation movement to struggle for all of those other democratic demands um, that are really about, you know, securing our future and securing safety for oppressed people. Um, so, you know, just an example from Dallas during um, the uprising and the George Floyd rebellion, um, there was a lot of demands that came out of that, uh, out of that movement. Um, and one of the ones that had a lot of, um, heat behind it was a defund movement, right? We've probably in other cities, they've seen it as well, as well too. demands to, um, take money away from the police department. And, um, you know, we've been building a, a campaign for community control in the city as, as well. So that's, th that was part of it, but we could have easily said, you know, they can do that, we'll do this, right? But what came out of that uprising was a coalition that was built of, you know, over 16 organizations in Dallas. And through that fight, we built trust because you build trust by organizing side by side. And through that, we were able to win folks over to the fight for community control by saying clearly, you know, we're fighting for a, a, a budget that meets the needs of the people, the only way that is going to ha happen is if we have the levers of power that 
make it so that the people are the decisive voice on the budget, right? So through coalition building and fighting side by side with people who had different ideas, um, we were able to, to unite and um, build, up, build up that campaign in a way that um, just wouldn't happen if, if we would have instead just kind of sat on the sidelines and, and criticize or, or this and that. So, you know, coalition building, it's, it's never an easy task. It, it means strategic compromises. Um, you know, unity is not that we ignore all the issues and contradictions, but it's that we prioritize action and what we can do to, to bring our campaigns forward and bring our movement forward as a whole. Um, because that, that unity, that's how we win. That's how we win. So, yeah, um, that's all I'll say. Okay, thank you, Sydney. And the next speaker, the last speaker on this part of the program is Frank Chapman. Frank is a longtime activist in the labor movement and the African American movement, and is the executive director of the National Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. And uh, thank everyone on the program for uh, uh, being a part of this, and I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it as well. Uh, this is a very, uh, a very important topic. Uh, this is a life and death struggle, and uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, I, I just want to talk about what the uh, National Alliance Against Race and Political Repression has been doing in, in, in Chicago and, 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 and the country, because what we've been doing here in Chicago kind of mirrors what, we, what we're doing in about 22 other different cities, uh, including, uh, including Dallas. Uh, as uh, Sydney pointed out, uh, we, we're engaged in the struggle for community control of the police, which means uh, we are fighting for uh, the democratic right to say who polices our communities and how our communities are policed. This is so important to black people and brown people because historically the police has been used in our communities to uh, you know, help maintain the status quo, to, to suppress uh, 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 our, our movements for liberation. And so it's, it's very critical that we, uh, that we not only put forth this demand, but fight for it in a correct manner. And I, and I think fighting for it in the correct manner is, 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 is along the lines that uh, Sydney just pointed out, we need to unite all of the people that we can possibly unite to, uh, uh, to, to engage in this struggle. And we've done that in Chicago. You know, we, 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 we've engaged over 150 different organizations in our struggle. And we have the very specific political objective. And that objective was to get a piece of legislation passed in the city council called Empowering Communities for Public Safety. And what this uh, legislation does is that, it's, it's, it's law now, but, but uh, so what it does is it, it gives the people in our community an opportunity to uh, have direct input into making police policy. And it's based on uh, 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 electing uh, three people from each police district onto a, uh, a, a council who will in turn uh, 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 nominate a citywide commission for overseeing the police, uh, not just overseeing them, not just reviewing them, but also making policies to change things, like making policies with regard to stop and frisk laws, making policy with regard to uh, no knock laws. You know, uh, we intend to ban all that. Making policy with regard to uh, 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 how, 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 how deadly weapons are used against our people, you know, to, uh, to murder them in the way that they've been murdered. Like for example, Laquan McDonald who was shot 16 times, two times, uh, the, the first two shots knocked him to the ground. And then while he was on the ground helpless, the police officers fired 14 more shots into his body. So uh, we were able to get that police officer uh, uh, charged, convicted and sent to jail. But he's the first police officer that ever uh, got convicted of anything with regard to violating the rights of black people in this city ever. Uh, 
So uh, that was a very important uh, 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 victory. Uh, but as important as that victory was, we feel like getting the law passed, empowering, our com empowering communities for public safety was a historic victory that uh, is even more important than getting a, 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 a Jason Van Dyke indicted and, uh, and, and convicted and sent to jail. Uh, because we need a systemic change. And that's what uh, uh, empowering communities for public safety is going to bring about, a systemic change. Uh, the law is just going into effect right now as I'm speaking. We just now uh, 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 put together a, a group of people who we uh, are going to be presenting to the city council to be on the uh, interim commission uh, for, for this, uh, for the, uh, for the empire communities of public safety to be implemented. And this interim commission will, be, will, will exist from now until 2023. In 2023, we will have elections. And, in, and, 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 and uh, to, to uh, do what I said earlier, in those elections, we will elect people in each of the 22 police districts. We will elect three people in each of the 22 police districts, which is, a, which is uh, 66 people. And those people will in turn uh, nominate uh, a citywide commission to, uh, to regulate uh, 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 police conduct and behavior. And I, and I say to regulate because uh, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, a lot of people didn't believe that we could get this kind of a law passed, uh, but here, we, we did it. And, 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 and the reason why we did it is because we built one of the most massive movements in the history of this city involving uh, the labor movement, involving churches, uh, involving uh, uh, all kinds of grassroots organizations and whatnot, like I said, 150 different organizations. And uh, that's what made this happen. And so we are very, uh, we're very excited about having this law passed and we were more excited about getting it implemented. And so we have a, uh, we have a very uh, 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 important task in front of us now and that is to uh, make sure that uh, our people uh, get an opportunity uh, uh, to uh, uh, exercise this power. And, and, and to that end, we are starting uh, next Saturday, next week, uh, March the, uh, the 5th, we're starting uh, a training schools to train, uh, on, on, you know, five week training sessions where we will train our people on how to uh, run in the police district, how to be candidates, and how to win. So I'll, 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 uh, I'll close it off with that. I'm sure people have questions of, of the other panelists, and I don't want to take up any more time. OK, thanks, Frank. Um, just to put a broad subject that people, some of you addressed it um, in some ways, but what is how do you go about building a coalition? I mean, what are the groups that you look to first, it, uh, particularly in, in the aftermath of there being a police shooting or some kind of uh, outrage against the people in terms of police violence? Um, and so any of you like Molly or any of those people, how, what were the actual processes you went about to build coalitions? And who were, who was, how were those coalitions made up? What forces, whether mostly in the African American community, mostly activists or existing groups or otherwise? Well, oh, I would say that it was a combination of existing groups and newly formed coalitions. Um, after the death of Tamir Rice, as I said, many people got ignited into action. And I can name probably over a dozen, maybe two dozen people who are full-time organizers now since 2014. Um, whole coalitions were formed um, and also, you know, historic organizations were, were you know, joined and, and refounded. Um, when it comes to kind of the national work of coalition building um, to take on the DOJ, uh, we, started with our, our comrades in DC. From there, went to the Poor People's Campaign, um, Black Lives Matter DC. Um, and in Cleveland, 
Black Lives Matter Cleveland uh, was an active role in our coalition. Um, we had uh, parts of the Democratic Party involved, like our revolution and Kyla County Progressive Caucus. So there was a, a, a left center coalition that was built um, in particular when it comes to addressing the political influence of the police, um, people, people across, you know, ideological um, spectrums other than the right wing, you know, were, were behind us. Um, for example, our question about whether candidates would seek or accept the endorsement of the Cleveland Police Union was the very first question of, of one of the debates for, for Cleveland mayor. Um, and then, you know, Sherrod Brown, uh, Senator Sherrod Brown welcomed Ms. Rice um, and listened to our coalition when we said, no, please don't <laughs> appoint um, the, the same U.S. attorney who brought us the consent decree, um, which hasn't worked at all. Please don't appoint him because he didn't do, he didn't do really anything. Uh, he created a, a structure that was just recommendations that the people could just recommend and have no authority. Um, and, you know, Sherrod Brown listened to us and you know, he had said to Ms. Rice directly, I already sent in my recommendation that this guy be appointed for the U.S. Um, the Northern District of the U uh, U.S. Attorney's Office. And we're like, don't, you know, take it back. <laughs> we sent it to, sent another letter to Biden and said, we are opposed to this. And, you know, it came, it worked, it worked in our favor. And that person was not was not nominated, and instead we have Marissa Darden, um, who I said is the first black woman in our in our history. So um, I hope I answered the question. There is kind of a broad, like you know, you go from you know communists and 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 really um, you know anarchists and and you know people on you know the people who want systemic change, people who want revolution. And then we also, you know, included folks who are like, um, well, maybe, maybe the right wing shouldn't be in power. <laughs> okay, thanks, Molly. Uh, anybody else have any comments on building coalitions and things that would help people that are listening in? Or experiences would help people? Yeah, um, yeah, I agree with uh, Molly's comments, you know, to the question of, where do you start when something happens and what do you look for? Like you look to who's active because that's going to tell you who's has, you know, who is about moving about making something happen, happen. Right. So you look to who's active and, um, you know, and start from there in terms of, um, you know, finding out what, what campaigns you can work together on. Okay, I, I agree with Molly and Sydney. Uh, you know, you you, uh, you build as broadly as you possibly can, and you and you include uh, you know people in the community who are already organized. They may be organized to do something else other than the fight police crimes, but we can get people all united and organized around this. Uh, also, an obvious place to start is with the families, with the people who have actually been been victimized and 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 traumatized. Uh, by the uh, by, the police, as Sister Rice just pointed out earlier, and and uh, we that's that's what we've done here in Chicago. We have a, a, a powerful uh, a, a group of families uh, that we brought together to file complaints with the United States Department of Justice about the police crimes in forty nine different families, and they filed complaints with regard to murder, with regard to torture, with regard to all of the things that the police do here to our people, and. Um, so that's a that's an obvious place to start, and and also start with a campaign, a campaign to bring about an end to police terror by getting community control of the police, and then you can get all different organizations and groups and and and, and family members and whatever to in, to endorse and be engaged in that campaign, and that 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 enables people to continue to do the organizing that they may be doing around housing and around jobs and other different things, but they can also participate in a coalition in the, 
that, that's, that's specific. That's specifically about getting community control of the police. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else want to address this topic? Um, yes, I'll go ahead and say something. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> although I'm not a coalition builder, I'm a mom and I'm a now I'm an activist and somewhat of an organizer. And what I can say is that um, me personally, I look for um, activists that's genuine, uh, genuine doing the work that can um, lead to, to lead a family member like myself that very clueless to what's going on. Like we be in a fog for a very long time and um, just like, I was kind of like, didn't know what I was doing. So I look for people, yeah, yeah, I thought I was looking for people that, you know, know what they doing in these situations. Um, that's what I could say to that. And just, um, again, working with the families and, and the activists kind of guiding us at the end of the day, you know, we're powerful, right? We have a voice and the people want to hear from us and things like that. And the activists kind of help us with that. Just to let y'all know, if no one told y'all, uh, people like myself, you know, I look for people to help me and, and give me right, right um, direction and not be fish fish straddlers, right? We don't need any fish straddlers when we building coalitions. I mean, we trying to make some change here in the country, whatever our jobs is. And I think for the most part, we have very important jobs. Like I said, God has put us in positions to um, get some change in this country. So I just wanted to say that. One other question, and maybe this would go to, to Frank. But is there some kind of model like what you did in Chicago and got passed in um, in the city council? Is there a kind of broad model legislation that people can rely on rather than having to construct something from uh, nothing? Or is it is yours aimed kind of uniquely at Chicago? No, uh, it's, it's not that unique. <laughs> Um, we, uh, we, we, the Alliance, we've been using a, a piece of model legislation that the ECPS is based on since 1977. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and in 1977, that, 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 that the model that we use was the uh, police control board that, that they had set up in Berkeley, California, uh, which, which came ultimately out of a campaign that was uh, uh, formed by the Black Panther Party. For community control of the police. And Gus Newport, who was the mayor of Berkeley at that time, also was a member of our national board of the National Alliance Against Race and Political Repression. And so we, get, we, just took the, we just took that legislation and we had, uh, we had uh, 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 our attorney, Lynn Paletti, and, and others to, uh, uh, to put together a model. And, 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 and we used that model to fashion uh, the legislation here in Chicago. That's how we ended up with ECPS. Uh, you know, models don't work perfectly because as you uh, as you get engaged in struggle, you know, you have to tailor it to fit to fit reality. But models do work, and so uh, uh, we uh, we still have those models, and 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 and, and we're sharing them with our uh, with our comrades uh, throughout the country, in, uh, in 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 23 different cities now. And so we can uh, we can also share it with, with, with people on this call, I mean on, on this panel, if they uh, if, if they would like if they would like to have it, no no problem. Okay, can they contact the alliance through your website to get copies of it? Yes, they can, and our and our website is uh, nwrpr.org, naarpr.org, and uh, yeah, you can you can you can get it through our website. In fact, after the night, we'll, we'll put the model up on our website. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do any of the other panelists want to speak on anything that you might not have had enough time because we still have a few minutes left? 
Um, I just want to offer just one um, contribution from the struggle in Cleveland. Um, issue 24 changed the charter of the city um, to include uh, this permanent board. Um, and I, and I, I, I just wanted to, you know, raise that because that, you know, it's different than an ordinance that can be, um, you know, reversed uh, if, you know, we lose power. Um, so I think well, that- This that is an oversight board that oversees the police you're talking about? Mm-hmm, that's right. So I wanted just to offer that as like something to keep in mind to see if cities can put this elected council into the actual charter of, of the city that you're in. It, it's called a civilian oversight. Um, and it is made of, of 13 uh, commission commissioners, which will have a stronger presence. Um, and unfortunately, three of them have to be <laughs> part of a department with policing, like the FOP and um, I guess the FOP and I think uh, somebody from the uh, maybe Black Shield and then the regular um, police department. I may be, I might have that last one wrong, but I just know that um, that's unfortunate, right? And then we have some other people that's going to be on the panel and then we have some recommendations that some people come in from the community that has that had experience with the police and, and other involvements or whatever could be a part of the panel i just hope that uh we get uh, uh people to sign up for those positions one other thing i wanted to touch base on uh, when you talk about defunding the police mm -hmm. um it really um goes back to their training right um i was talking to a, a good friend of mine and she said that we should challenge the training um when it comes to policing in our communities and our country you know in this country period um because evidently they are sending uneducated undertrained people to our communities and don't know nothing about us and that's just not fair to put that type of responsibility in another human's hand when they're uneducated and untrained. So when you talk about defunding the police, yes, we wanna take some of the money for our community. <clears throat> we wanna hold city council, definitely hold them you know, accountable and things like that. But we also wanna make sure that they're being trained properly. And I think we can all start there and making sure they have, um, the qualifications that they need, you know, far as a, a sociology, a psychology certificate, you know, or require them to have an associate's degree, random drug testing and, and, and background testing for a state mental, the mentalness. Um, <clears throat> I just don't think that they are aware of the damage and the harm that they do um, to, uh, American citizens, black and black and brown American citizens on top of that. So I think it's a conversation to be had with the uh, the academy, the academy when it comes to policing in this country, because there's no way that they shouldn't have no type of common sense when it comes to uh, making a judgment as quickly as they made in my son's situation. Let me just say that, you know, um, you know, Timothy Loma, he was a very bad officer. He slid through the cracks. Most of them do. Most of them get promoted when they do something wrong. You know what I'm saying? And it's just a cover up and conspiracy on top of one another. So again, it, it goes, it goes way deep. It goes way deep with, um, you know, um, having those conversations, mm -hmm. you know, with with the governors or um, of, of, of the state, you know, and, and trickle it on down from the governors to senators and whatever conversation they need to have when it comes to this police academy, because the police academy has failed and it has not worked for anyone. 
It has not worked for no one. Who are training these police officers? Where do they come from? Why aren't the criteria not more um, stricter? You know, and, and if you're a police officer, you should be uphold to look a certain type of way. How are you a police officer if you're eating donuts all day long? You can't be a police officer. Again, at the end of the day, um, you know, we the people, <laughs> We, 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 the ones that rule and, 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 and they, they know we rule, but most of us are so sleep. We don't know no better. So at the end of the day, we have to have accountability for ourselves and knowing that we have the power, you know, uh, and we are the people that put these people in office. Again, when it comes to, uh, you know, the more political range when it comes to Congress and uh, the, the Republican Party and the Democrat Party, I think there's a conversation to be had because how they're not helping us, like how are you just for the wealthy, that's not going to work. And if that's the case, we need to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, America is built up on a rainbow of people. And that's all I'm going to say It's built up on a rainbow of people, American citizens. And it's going to take all of us, allies and all, for us to come on one accord. It's too many chiefs and not enough Indians. And God only picks the, his chiefs the, to, to lead at the end of the day. And, and most people, when it comes to egotistic and stuff like that, they need to, they need to listen to these uh, people like myself and Fred Chapman, the ones that have experience, we can lead y'all to victory. It, again, when it comes to coalition building, it just be a lot to deal with. So mm -hmm. I'm just letting you all know from my perspective, what I have experienced being a mother thrown into this, two children still in school at the time of, of Tamir's murder, and me still, and I done went through three administrations. I went through Obama administration, I went through the Trump administration, and now I have went through the Biden administration, and I have, I'm still fighting here. So I don't have time to play these games with, with time. I don't have time with Mary Lewis. I don't. It's going to be the people's way, and that's the only way. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that this is going to work. You know, at the end of the day, you know, again, it has to start somewhere, you know, and I think police academy is, is another place that we can start on top of making sure we have civilian oversights in major urban cities across the country. Why not? They all could, they have all could participated in conspiracy and murders of murders in every urban community across the country. So, I mean, again, <laughs> Molly know how to get in contact with me, but at the end of the day, I have a I have a formula, I have a solution because I created one of the black liberation formulas when it comes to getting your children out of school. I have I have four high school graduates, including Tamir Rice. All of my children graduated high school, all of them. It just because that's what I wanted and I set the formula for them to do it. So, and that's why I created the Timmy Rice Afro Central Culture Center. I have a formula to make sure our children win at mm -hmm. the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I have a formula. So thank you all. Thank you all for having me. It's been a pleasure, been an honor uh, and I'm open to questions. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes. We, have, we have one question that came over to any of the panelists. Um, and that is in terms of the proposed forms of legislation, do they only kick in when there's a, a, a incidence of police violence or what about police harassment of people or nonviolent forms of police misactivity? The legislation that we have in Chicago that, that's been passed uh, is, uh, has to do with us controlling the policy making with regard to the conduct of the police. So it, it, it doesn't it doesn't depend on whether or not the police have, uh, have, have committed an act. In fact, uh, the legislation is set up in such a way where our, our commission can uh, uh, set policy where these acts uh, are, are abolished, where police cannot do uh, uh, no knock law, no, you know, kick down somebody's uh, door without a warrant, no knock warrants, uh, where the police cannot uh, do stop and frisk. You know, uh, a lot of that's based on, uh, you know, racial profiling right. with the police. So, you know, our, our, our objective here politically is to uh, prohibit police misconduct 
prohibit police from committing these murders. And, and in order to do that, we must be in, 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 we must be empowered to uh, to make the changes. So I, I want to just say this here in addition to that, so uh, people will know, uh, when you go look at our legislation online, uh, if you are a police officer, if you if, 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 if you were a police officer, you cannot be on our commission unless you've been unless you've been off the force for five years. You cannot be on our commission. You cannot be on our commission if you are a police officer unless you've been off the force for five years. And does any of the proposals around there go towards the training of police, like Mrs. Rice was discussing? Yeah, yeah, we 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 uh, we, we stopped the a police academy from being built here because, uh, uh, but yeah, of course. Do any of the panelists have any parting thoughts that they want to uh, say? All I know, I wish we would have thought of that, Mr. Chapman, <laughs> when we were um, um, doing our civilian oversight. Not too late. Uh, <laughs> Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, definitely gonna, I'm, I'm definitely going to mention that because right now, like I said, we have uh, the Black Shield, the FOP, and the regular, somebody from the regular police department that's on it. I wish we would have knew that if you was going to be a part of it, you had to be five years out. That's a great idea. Yeah, not too late. Also, we have um, a federal judge that is um, over our consent decree right now. His name is Judge Oliver. He has to get a little bit more aggressive with making sure that the police department get in compliance before the DOJ leave. Have you all um, had to go through any of that? Because they're not in compliance, uh, Mr. Chapman. Yeah, we, 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 we're we dealing with that as well. We got a consent decree here that, that, that uh, that that is not being not being enforced. Mm. There, there, there are good things in the consent decree, but, but see, uh, by, us, by us having this commission, by us having set up this commission, we can uh, we can we can go past the consent decree. We can we can do things that the consent decree can't do because it's written into law. Let me let me strongly advise that, that you go on our uh, on our on our on our local web website, uh, cwarpr.org. And actually look at the legislation. It's empowering communities for public safety. It's on our uh, on our local website, cwarpr.org, or stoppolicecrimes.com. Either one, okay? Okay. Uh, okay. Mo thank you, Molly. You wanted to make a point about uh, how people could support the Justice for Tamir campaign. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, if you go to tamirscampaign.org, it'll take you to our action network in which you'll find all of our petitions and you can sign our petitions, even if they're kind of um, from the past, we'll still be able to uh, get your email so we can keep you updated as we move forward. Right now, we're um, looking forward to the next couple of years and I'm trying to make sure that the prosecutor O'Malley uh, is uh, taken out of office in the next uh, the next election, and that we elect somebody who is committed to uh, reopening Tamir's case and and conducting an actually fair grand jury process that's not biased toward the police. So um, you know we're uh, active in um, recruiting that person right now, but also creating a sense of public indictment. Uh, for the cops and for the prosecutor that were involved uh, in this in this case, and we just need people to 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 join us. Um, as we talked about already, you know the broad the broadest movement that we can, the better. And at the same time, um, being really careful about um, any type of uh, opportunism and tokenism. Uh, as as you're as as we're you know building our allies and and our, our partners in this, it's um, you know it's it's just really important that Tamir's legacy is is honored, and that's true for for any any victim of police murder and and violence that their that their names are not uh, taken to to benefit anyone privately or personally. Um, 
you know, and that, that, that goes for, for everyone, <laughs> including myself. Not, I'd like to thank um, all the people who um, attended this. I'd like to especially thank all of the uh, people who agreed to be panelists. And um, I think from the comments that I see, people found this uh, very helpful. And hopefully it will lead people to starting similar kind of organizations uh, in their own community and hopefully to build organizations like the Alliance or like Black, Black Lives Matter uh, without waiting for an act of violence to happen, but to uh, be proactive uh, in starting these organizations and such seeking out some form of um, community control of police. So on behalf of the African-American Equality Commission of the Communist Party, again, thanks all the panelists for participating. Thanks to all the people for dialing in and be safe.